Welcome, everyone. I'm your host, Steve Meisick, and today my guest is Rush Neuromuscular Spe Specialist, excuse me, Dr. Ryan Jacobson. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And before we get started, I wanted to encourage everyone watching to share their questions for Dr. Jacobson in the comments uh, of the Facebook Live. We'll make time to ask some of the best ones at the end of the interview. But to get things started, can you tell us a little bit about your various roles at Rush? Uh, sure. So uh, here at Rush, I'm a neuromuscular specialist, which means that I'm a neurologist who specializes in conditions that specifically affect the peripheral nerves and the muscles and their connections. Uh, so I'm, you know, busy in our clinics, our EMG laboratory, and I'm also very involved in medical education here. Right. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your professorial role at Rush Medical College? Um. Sure. So, you know, we're very proud of our education mission here at Rush and integrating that with what we do clinically. Um, so I work very closely with our residency program, and we've also started a new neuromuscular medicine fellowship here at Rush uh, to train uh, future neuromuscular specialists to diagnose and treat diseases like ALS. Gotcha. Interesting. So, as you mentioned, today we're talking about the neurodegenerative condition ALS. And I just wondered, can you start us off by telling us what the acronym ALS stands for and how it affects the body? Uh, absolutely. So, uh, ALS stands for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Uh, ALS is also called Lou Gehrig's disease. Right. Uh, and uh, ALS is a neurological condition that affects motor function. Um, because what's occurring is injury or degeneration to the motor neurons, the nerve cells that are specifically responsible uh, for controlling muscles. So the typical symptom of ALS is muscle weakness. Uh, and that muscle weakness could affect many different parts of the body, including the, the hands, arms, feet, legs, uh, face, swallowing, or breathing. Gotcha. And so... Um, this is a progressive condition. So, um, how does it usually manifest in the body over time as it progresses? So, typically, somebody experiencing symptoms of ALS, uh, the most common symptom is muscle weakness, difficulty moving a hand, or a weakness in a leg or foot drop, uh, or difficulty speaking or swallowing. Uh, and one of the typical features of ALS is that the symptoms progress and spread over time. And indeed, this is one of the typical clues that the doctor or neurologist listens for or, or looks for in, in talking to somebody and examining to some, somebody to help make the correct diagnosis. And how is ALS diagnosed? So ALS is one of these diagnoses where there's not a single test that can diagnose or confirm it. Mm. So there's not a specific blood test that can give us an absolute answer. There's not a type of MRI scan that can give us a definite answer. Electrical testing of the nervous system or EMG testing is commonly employed. But this too is more of a tool in making the diagnosis uh, than a definitive diagnostic test. At the end of the day, ALS is uh, what we consider to be a clinical diagnosis, meaning that it's based upon somebody's symptoms and signs, uh, how those things have changed over time, and also doing additional tests to rule out mimics of ALS. Right, and actually I was just about to ask, how can you tell it apart from other progressive neurological conditions? So, you know, as we mentioned a moment ago, ALS is, is a motor disorder. Um, so it should be causing symptoms of progressive muscle weakness or atrophy or spasticity or tone changes in the muscles. Um, but when somebody begins experiencing other neurological symptoms, uh, maybe uh, tremors or numbness or very unusual pains, uh, then sometimes that can point in a different direction. Um, we use our tests to help rule out other conditions that could cause symptoms similar to ALS. That includes doing things like MRI scans to make sure there's not a, a spine problem, for example. 
uh, and using the EMG testing to demonstrate that there is a type of nerve degeneration occurring typical of ALS. I see. And what do we currently know about the causes of ALS? So that's an excellent question. And it's a source of a lot of ongoing inquiry and questions. Uh, at the end of the day, we're uncertain what the cause is of ALS in the typical individual. About 90% of ALS is what we refer to as sporadic disease, mm. whereas 10% is, is familial or hereditary. I see. Uh, and the disease is running in somebody's family. Uh, even in that category of sporadic disease, in a small minority of patients, we're able to identify a mutation or abnormality in the DNA uh, that accounts for why ALS is taking place. Uh, other times, it's less certain. There are likely genetic or hereditary factors that are important, uh, as well as uh, environmental factors that are important. And the interplay of these uh, uh, different uh, processes can likely trip off this process of neurodegeneration, uh, which then progresses and spreads over time. And how common is ALS and who does it most commonly affect? Uh, so, you know, that's a great question. And ALS is a disease that people often hear about in, in the media, in the news, yeah. uh, in their social circle. And ultimately, it's not very rare. Hmm. Uh, the lifetime risk of ALS in a male is about 1 in 250. The lifetime risk of ALS in a female is maybe about 400. Mm -hmm. um, so it's rare, but not extremely rare. If you think about where you went to high school, um, there's a good chance that, you know, the odds would favor somebody in your graduating class being diagnosed with ALS over their lifetime. Uh, ALS is seen across all geographic areas can affect people of uh, any background, urban, mm. rural, um, you name it. Um, so there's, you know, a, a large uh, um, um, battle to be fought of raising awareness for this disease um, because it can really be seen in, in communities um, anywhere in the world. Uh, it's a disease that gets more common with aging. So mm -hmm. it becomes more common in every decade after the 40s. Um, the typical age of onset is, is, you know, perhaps in the 60s, although we have many people in our practice who develop symptoms at an older age. And mm -hmm. symptoms, unfortunately, are, are possible in younger ages as well and in young adults rarely too. Now, you mentioned that it seems to be more common amongst men than women. Do we have... I know there's not a lot of concrete information about the causes, but do we have any understanding about the any correlations between why it's more common amongst men? Uh, we don't have a, a clear answer uh, on that point, uh, and it's poorly understood. And there are a lot of epidemiological factors related to ALS, um, the, the underlying science of which is still emerging. Uh, another example of that is uh, the complex relationship between ALS and those who served in the military. Mm. Uh, and we know that there's an increased risk of uh, uh, ALS in veterans. Uh, what we don't always perfectly understand is why, um, because the risk of ALS does not clearly uh, correlate with, for example, uh, the degree of head trauma that a man or woman may have received in the service. Um, so our, our knowledge of some of these epidemiological features underlying ALS are definitely still an active area of research. Gotcha. Um, so what medications are maybe not specifically, but are there medications available for treating ALS? Uh, it's a great question. Um, the bottom line is we do have treatments for ALS, but we don't have the types of treatments that we want that can stop the disease in its tracks um, and reverse weakness. 
Um, that's why there's such an urgency to develop more time and resources into treating and researching this disease. Uh, at the present time, we do have some medications that are uh, approved by the FDA, others before the FDA right now, and some medications that are approved for specific symptoms of ALS. Uh, there are a couple of uh, oral medications that are available. One of them ha has been available for, for a very long time called Rilazole that works on a neurochemical called glutamate. Uh, and there's another treatment uh, called Adaravone, uh, which has been around for about five years now in an IV formulation. Uh, and just in the last month, in an oral formulation of, of uh, that medication has gained FDA approval as well. Uh, and these medications have been shown to slow down the progression of weakness somewhat. Um, but they don't halt the progression of weakness, which is why the work very much continues in this area. And beyond medication, what other treatment options are available that can help someone who's experiencing ALS? So the symptoms of ALS can be many because the muscle weakness can really affect several different systems of the body. So our approach to care here at Rush and indeed the standard of care across many centers is to offer multidisciplinary care. Uh, and that means engaging a full team in the treatment and management of that individual and their symptoms to optimize their quality of life. Uh, that can be things as simple as um, the neurologist working with you on different symptoms that you're experiencing, uh, like aches and pains, uh, or um, other symptoms like muscle cramping, for example. Um, but it also um, requires multiple different types of helpers and therapists. Mm -hmm. So people with ALS can be prone to a very tenuous nutritional status, difficulty swallowing. Uh, and therefore, you know, a good team also includes a dietitian and a speech language pathologist. Uh, the muscle weakness of ALS can commonly affect respiratory muscles as well. So mm -hmm. the team often includes respiratory therapists uh, that measure the breathing strength and also pulmonologists that can talk to patients about the options for managing respiratory weakness if it's present. Our team also includes physical therapists, occupational therapists, uh, social workers, um, genetic counselors, uh, and others. Uh, our clinic here at Rush is, is um, uh, uh, we're very grateful for the support of a group called the ALS Association or the mm. ALS Association of Greater Chicago Chapter um, that uh, provides tremendous care resources uh, for people living with ALS and their families. Uh, so it really uh, takes a village to engage with people living with ALS and their families uh, to help as much as possible. And what recent advances have been made in ALS research? Obviously, you mentioned that some uh, treatments are currently in front of the FDA, but uh, generally speaking, what are some of the recent advances? So there are definitely a number of very active areas of research when it comes to ALS. Uh, so in terms of uh, medications, you know, there is a third oral compound uh, that is before the FDA right now called AMX0035 that many of our patients have, have been um, following along closely. Uh, but there are a number of clinical trials going around uh, the, in, in the United States right now. Uh, the largest of these is uh, referred to as the platform trial or the Healy platform trial. Uh, which is a very large multi-center study where patients are um, being trialed on a number of different medications that typically are working on a sort of anti-inflammatory or immune-related basis. Hmm. That study really highlights that not only are we continuing to actively research ALS, but we're getting smarter about the way that we're doing it. Uh, and running trials in uh, uh, new ways that are collaborative and get more treatments to patients. Beyond uh, uh, treatments and clinical trials, 
um, risk factors for ALS, environmental and occupational risk factors of ALS are an ongoing area of study. And the genetics of ALS are another um, huge area of research. Um, and in the last decade, our knowledge of the genetic underpinnings of ALS has expanded greatly. That's important because it can answer questions for patients. And it can also lead to uh, new areas of uh, study in terms of potential treatments for those groups of patients. And piggybacking off of what you just said, with a portion of ALS cases being hereditary, what has genetic analysis taught us about the condition and the people affected by it? So um, it's a good question, um, and it's it's a complicated issue. Um, you know, we're learning that there are many different genetic abnormalities that can lead to this disease ALS. Um, and it's interesting to us because very different genetic abnormalities can sometimes lead to a similar appearing clinical picture uh, in, in people. Um, we're also learning that uh, some people who appear to have a sporadic form of ALS can actually be found to have a genetic uh, abnormality uh, mm -hmm. underneath. Uh, and in those people that can have implications for their family and in the near future, it may have implications for their treatment as well. Um, so, you know, it, it's fairly common for us in our clinic to have discussion about um, genetics and whether or not that's an avenue an individual is interested in learning more about. Certainly. Well, that's all the time we have today, but thank you, Dr. Jacobson for taking the time to talk with me today. Of course. And thanks to everyone who tuned in and watched and participated in some way. We encourage you to visit rush.edu for more information about our neuromuscular and uh, neurodegenerative programs. Um, and please stay tuned for more live broadcasts from Rush on our Facebook page. <laughs>